We are following another new update in one of the many criminal investigations into Donald Trump. Now, there are a lot. I know it's hard to keep track of them all, but this is in regards to the hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. Now, you'll remember Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney, went to prison for signing those checks to Daniels for keeping quiet during the 2016 campaign about her alleged affair with Trump. And Trump, although directly implicated in Cohen's sentencing memo as individual one, was let off the hook when Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg chose not to prosecute after the grand jury wrapped up last year, much to the dismay of many who worked on the case, including one of the leading prosecutors, Mark Pomerantz, who writes in his new book that the office was just weeks away from filing criminal charges against Trump at the end of 2020. Well, now the wheels are once again in motion as Bragg convened a new grand jury to investigate those same allegations against the twice impeached former president. Just yesterday, Michael Cohen sat down with prosecutors for the 15th time and says a date for a 16th meeting has already been, been set. But skeptics might look at this and say, so what? We've seen this time and time again. Trump is investigated for a crime with a mountain of evidence against him. And just when you think he's going to finally be held legally accountable for one of his many misdeeds, nothing. What might seem like pretty, a pretty obvious crime that for you or, or me would result in jail time, he gets away with, scot-free, which is what one of my next guests writes about in his new book, is actually pretty common <laughs> for the rich and the powerful. Surprise, surprise. Joining me now is Michael Cohen, former personal attorney to Donald Trump and author of Disloyal, and Ellie Honig, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York and author of the new book, Untouchable, How Powerful People Get Away With It. And I have my copy right here, excited to read it. But I want to start with you, Michael. You've been interviewed, you've got, you're going in for a 16th interview. In your mind, what is different now than before? Because attorney Alvin Bragg seemed to be declining this case, and now it's sort of reopened. There's very little that's different. It's relatively the same information that Alvin Bragg is processing on his own. Let's not forget that Cy Vance ended up leaving. Now, Cy Vance could have easily brought the case, yeah. but then again, Alvin Bragg would then inherit it. So I think Cy did the right thing, but Alvin Bragg needed to get caught up to speed. And I think he felt pressured, and so he backed away. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have to do is give the guy, we have to give the guy a little room, sure. right? Um, everybody's using these metaphors of transportation, aviation, right, that the plane wasn't ready to yeah. take off. Well, OK, yeah. let's stay on that same, the you know, that same genre. And what we'll do is we'll say right now the plane is taxiing and we're getting real close to the runway. Yeah. All right. At the end of the day, what's the goal? The destination that you're intending that destination will be had. Well, you know, there, there are two different cases that I feel like you are intrinsically knowledgeable about. There is this case that we have the check, we'll put it on, on the, these checks, the reimbursement went to you from him, from Donald Trump himself. There is no way around it. You were not having an affair with Stormy Daniels. No. He was, right? So, so that seems so clear. But then the other one was you testified to the fact that he was revaluing, devaluing, and then upping the value of his properties. You testified to that under oath before Congress that he was doing that. That has resulted in him getting some fines. He was fined for some of that behavior. But do, do you feel that at this point he appears untouchable? No. In fact, let's take a look so far what Alvin Bragg has accomplished. Uh, they've already held the Trump Organization accountable. Minor fine, $1.6 sure. when you're worth $10 billion, if not more, right? Then, of course, you also have uh, the Alan Weisselberg matter. We now have the attorney general, our unsinkable, you know, Tish James. It's going to take a lot of money off of the out of the Trump coffers. Yeah. Let's be, you know, real about that sure. one. So he is being held accountable. And each and every day, he's held more and more count. You know, a lot of people don't realize, for example, there was the case of Galicia. That's where they beat up the protesters mm -hmm. in front. He paid on that one. Now, we don't know how much because it's under gag. Right. But at the end of the day, he is actually held accountable. It's the same myth that gets perpetuated. Oh, Donald Trump, he's untouchable. Yeah. No, it's not true. Yeah. He is touchable. And I do have faith in Alvin Bragg. I will say this as well that I was very impressed with Mark Pomerantz and Carrie Dunn. Mm -hmm. I've actually, after 10 sessions with them, three additional when I was in Otisville, I was very impressed with Alvin, with um, Cy Vance's team, with Mark Pomerantz, Carrie Dunn, and the whole group of them. Right. 
I'm equally impressed with this group as well. They, okay. they got up to speed very quickly. Mm -hmm. They're knowledgeable. They know there's a lot of information that they had to go through. They know the information, and they're preparing. That makes me feel good. But now I'm going to move on to this book, which sure. is going to make me feel bad. <laughs> because the reality is, you know, you, how powerful people get away with it. How do they do it? Yeah, so if you look at Michael Cohen's case, the hush money payments, the simple fact that the only person who's ever been held meaningfully accountable in a criminal context is this guy, Michael Cohen, who was essentially a bagman. He was a pass-through right. for the checks is indefensible and outrageous. And in that book, I have reporting from really the flip side of Michael's book. Michael tells what it was like to be prosecuted sure. for those hush money payments. I have the story in here of what was happening inside my former office, the Southern District of New York, when they prosecuted Michael. And there's this really important and I think interesting moment. When it comes January 2021, Trump is now leaving office and the Southern District of New York has to decide, well, what do we do? Now we can indict him. Right. And they've already, you know, Michael's already been in jail by yeah. this point. And they decide, we know what they decided. They said no. Yeah. And the reasons, I think, are going to be disturbing to some people. The reasons were not directly related to the evidence. The team felt they did have evidence of Trump's involvement. Michael right. said it. Yeah. I mean, the Southern District of New York did not fully credit Michael. Yeah. He, he disagrees with this, but they, they did not take him as a cooperator. But the evidence, I mean, they say it in the sentencing memo. Mm -hmm. Michael Cohen acted for and at the direction of individual, individual one. one. Yeah. Right. But they were thinking about political concerns. One, one prosecutor on the team phrased it to me as, quote, prudential concerns with indicting a former president. They also felt at the time that Trump had done so many other things. This is weeks after January 6th that by then the hush money scheme had sort of receded in the memory. It was maybe fifth or sixth on the list. And so yeah. they gave him a pass. That to me is completely unjust. I mean, I think everyone agrees. Now, yeah. will he remain untouchable? I think the signs are increasingly present that he will be indicted by mm -hmm. somebody. I think the DA in Fulton County is the most likely. But indictment's one thing, and conviction's very, very different. And every day that passes, I think that task gets more and more difficult for well, prosecutors. And the thing is, I think what, what, what makes people disturbed about this the system is that it feels like if you... I mean, Trump has been equated to a mob boss. Yeah. So if you present violence as a possibility among your supporters, it's almost inoculative, right? It almost yeah. get, lets you get away with more crime because people are so afraid of what your people might do as a result. I want to play a soundbite for you guys. This is Jamie Raskin, because we're talking about weaponization tonight. That's one of the topics on this show. <laughs> this is what Jamie Raskin had to say about the weaponization of government that relates to you. Michael Cohen, take a look. After Cohen was in prison for a year and then being transferred out of prison to home confinement during COVID-19, Barr and the DOJ intervened to block his transfer because Cohen would not immediately accept as a condition of his ankle bracelet home confinement not to engage in First Amendment activities, specifically writing and publishing a book about Donald Trump or saying anything in public on TV or in the social media about Donald Trump. Can you think of a more egregious example of weaponizing the Department of Justice for nakedly political purposes than imprisoning and putting in solitary confinement the president's own former lawyer simply because he wanted to exercise his First Amendment rights. I'm going to give Michael the last word, but Ellie, that can be the opening to your book. I mean, you want to talk about weaponization. Bill Barr should be witness number 1A. I I mean, nobody, I, that was my first book, actually, nobody has <laughs> right. weaponized DOJ like Bill Hello. Barr. I mean, he was dishonest. He used the office for nakedly political purposes, not least of which was throwing Michael That's back in jail That's for not right. basically agreeing to be silent on his yeah. book. I think it was an outrage. And, and I, I do give Michael credit. I mean, yeah. he's been through a lot. And, and you want to talk weaponization, get Bill Barr up there. There you go.